When I'm thinking about cerebral palsy, most families think of that as a diagnosis and I like them to think about it as more of a description. And particularly it's a problem with movement and tone and it can begin with issues before you're born, at the time of birth or soon after birth. The most common presentation that I see that leads to a diagnosis is a delay in the motor milestones or in their overall development. And so children will come to me and I'll take the history and then also on the examination find issues with movement and tone that would go along with that diagnosis. It can be hard to make the diagnosis early on, but certainly by the age of two, you can be sure of the diagnosis by that time. So there's a number of different causes and that's why I think it's important for families to understand that it's not a single diagnosis. Sometimes the brain will form differently right from the get-go inside a mum's womb or a baby can have issues around the time of the delivery and have injury to the brain or they can have an injury to the brain early in life uh, before the age of two and that can also lead to cerebral palsy. If children are born prematurely they're particularly at risk for injury in the white matter, which is the wiring of the brain. So I thought it might be helpful to think about how we can view the brain. And so this is a cut above the eyes, right through the brain. And it shows all the way around the outside, there's this grayish color, and that's all the cells of the brain or our thinking part of our brain. And then these white little things that you see here are actually all the fibers that go down out to the arms and legs. And so you can't see them very well, but these little dark areas there are actually the lateral ventricles and they're filled with fluid. This actually shows it in a different way. And this is a cut down through the brain this way. And so these bits here are actually the fluid filled areas called the lateral ventricles. And so you can see that it's surrounded by the white matter, these connections between the two hemispheres and all the white matter that goes down, comes down these areas and down out to the arms and legs. And so if you have an injury to this area, you can see that it would affect the wiring of the brain and then it affects the movement and tone of the arms and legs. And it could be one arm and one leg, it could be both legs, it could be one arm, it could be one leg, or it could be all four limbs. So if people say their child is, oh, right-handed, I've known that since five months of age, that's actually a red flag that there's something with the left side. And so then if that's the case, then we take a look at that and see if there is a problem with that left side. Because normally you can almost divide a baby down the middle, but if they cross the midline to, to grab a toy, then that tells us there's something with the other side that's an issue. So that would be one thing. And then the other thing is delays in rolling, sitting, crawling, all of those gross motor movements that we expect to happen over that first year of life. Children who have cerebral palsy are at increased risk for seizures compared to the general population. So one of the things I often do is tell them about that. It doesn't mean their child will have seizures, but they're definitely at increased risk. As soon as you have a brain injury or the brain formed differently, the risk is there. And so I usually describe seizures to people, help them understand what to expect. And then if they do see repetitive movements that they can't interrupt, I get them to let me know. So it's really a clinical diagnosis. So if you have a history that may have put the child at, at risk for cerebral palsy, that would be a flag already. Uh, so there'd been difficulty at the time of delivery, or we knew in utero that there was a concern regarding the brain development, or perhaps they presented with seizures and that brought it all to attention. Either way, um, I would make the diagnosis based on my clinical findings, and then you do an MRI to determine what the actual issue with the brain is, because the, the MRI is actually a test of structure, and so you can actually see any changes in the brain that might have caused it. The care of children with cerebral palsy is not just a single person, it really is a team approach, and so we would refer them to physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and also if needed speech therapy, because sometimes if your muscles are affected, it also affects your ability to talk and it can also affect your ability to swallow. So speech and occupational therapy can also do an assessment around that as well. What we're really trying to do is to help the children be the best they can be. 
and so we want to help them be able to mobilise. So if at all possible, we find ways to help the kids either crawl and then start to walk, all of those movements that we expect them to do. The other thing is, if some of their muscles are really tight, sometimes we can do things like stretching exercises, we can do what's called serial casting, and so we can stretch the muscle and hold it in position with the cast, and then that helps it stay like that for a period of time. And then the other thing that we can do is use Botox, which people think is more beauty treatment, but you can actually use it to make the muscles a little more lax and allow the joints to have more movement. Cerebral palsy can have all different effects depending on the level of injury that the brain has sustained or how challenging the brain malformation might be. So if you have a brain malformation that affects the whole brain, then a child might be globally delayed. So what we mean by that is they're not only delayed in their motor skills, they're also delayed in their speech, their cognition, and their social interaction. So every aspect of development. So that is quite a significant impact for children that have severe spastic quadriplegia, then they often will require total care. It can range all the way from that to perhaps a single limb being involved. So they have stiffness in one limb, in which case um, people can often get on with their life and be able to do everything they're interested in. They can have the normal social life, go to school, be able to interact with their peers and other people. So it really is very much a range and it depends on how the brain has been affected and what they're interested in doing. Cerebral palsy is what we call a static encephalopathy. So what we mean by that is what you see is what you get. And so the injury is there and it doesn't worsen over time. What does happen though is the muscles can get a bit tighter over time and that's why you need to maintain the exercises, the stretching, and also perhaps some input from a physiatrist as well to help with mobility. And so we're very fortunate to have the Stan Cassidy Centre in Fredericton and all of my patients go to the cerebral palsy clinic there and so they would be the physicians that would administer Botox if needed, help with uh, managing their gait, so their ability to walk and ideas for that. They also have what's called a speech augmentation team and so they can help the kids find other ways apart from um, oral speech to be able to communicate. You can't cure cerebral palsy, but what you can do is maximise function. And once the brain tissue has died, we can't regenerate it currently, at least. And so what we do is try to help the brain function the best it can. If you really help a child when they're young, brains in young children are what we call plastic. And what I mean by that is they have a, an ability to remodel to some degree. It's not perfect, but it's quite remarkable. So let me give you an example. If most people are left hemisphere dominant for speech. And so if you have an early insult to the brain and it involves the left hemisphere, if the speech area was involved, it just moves it to the other side. So the brain is pretty cool, and I know I'm biased, but that's, uh, that's the amazing thing about it. It can actually rewire and help the functioning of that child. I think what's really happened over my career is there's so many support groups online for families, which sometimes can be challenging because they sometimes get misinformation that isn't helpful to them. But it can be an incredible support to share your experience with someone who's gone through the same thing. So I think finding like-minded people to get support from one another can be very helpful. The other thing is we have people in the hospital who can help families understand their child more and so child life would be one of them and uh, really finding ways to help them play, to engage and interact with one another. I think child life does a fantastic job of that and also helping them communicate in different ways like even with drawings, um, toys, you name it, helping them understand some of the procedures they might go through and just to have some support for that. And so it's important to give your child a chance and to really look at them and not think of the name, to really think about what they're capable of. And our goal is to help them reach their maximum potential.